Welcome to our session today. We're going to be looking at one of the parts of the Bible that we don't often read. The last part, the last few verses of the book of Haggai, which appears near the end of the Old Testament. And this is what it says. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers, horses and their riders. They will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant, Zerubbabel, son of Shaltiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. The story of Haggai is an interesting one. The children of Israel had been slaves in uh, Babylon for 70 years, and eventually they were allowed to come back under Cyrus to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. They were excited about it, and they were thrilled to go back. And about 50,000 people went in the first wave of those that went back to rebuild the city and the temple. But because of opposition, eventually it got too much for them and they gave up and they spent their time looking after themselves and not building the temple at all. And so the Lord had to send the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to tell them to get on with the work. But they felt so inadequate, they felt so feeble, they felt that they couldn't do it, they, the enemies were strong and the work was so great. When they went back into the city, there was nothing left. There was just piles of rubble and charred timbers, and they thought the work was too great, which is why they gave up. And so they didn't feel they had what it took to do it. They didn't even feel they had enough materials and money to do it. And the Lord had to send Zechariah and said, you know, one of the reasons for that is that you've been spending money on yourself. You've been living in your panelled houses. You've been putting up your own extensions and your own, uh, uh, having your own makeovers in your houses instead of building the house of the Lord. You need to get up and get on and get on with the work. But they still felt so inadequate. So one of the things that the prophet brought to them as a word from the Lord was this wonderful thought to Zerubbabel, son of Shaltiel, and he was the civic governor of the people. He, God said to, said to him through the prophet, I will make you like my signet ring. And I'm quite sure that when the Lord said that to him, he was wanting to encourage him. Now, what does that mean to us today? Well, I don't know whether you wear a ring. I wear a wedding band on my finger. It shows that I'm married. But um, I don't know if you wear rings or not. But there are lots of reasons why people have rings. This is described as a signet ring. And a signet ring comes from the same root of the word signature. It shows the authority of the person whose ring, it, whose finger it was on. It speaks of real dignity. And God said to Zerubbabel, you need not fear because I have chosen you. Have you ever been to try and choose a ring? It's never easy to choose a ring for somebody else. Would she like this one or would she like that one? Have you got enough money to buy that one, which is by far the most expensive one? And it's quite difficult to choose a ring. And the wonderful thing is, though, that God said to Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, I'm making you my, like, like my signet ring because I've chosen you. You've been chosen. There are some wonderful descriptions of this leader, Zerubbabel, one of which is that he was the governor of the people. Another one is that he's the servant of the Lord. Now, where would you think the most honour was? In being governor of the people? Well, there certainly is no doubt that there's great dignity in being leader of the people of God. And so he was, even if it was only a small and fragmented group who had gone back to rebuild the temple. But the greater dignity is the fact that he is the servant of the Lord. Not much came from his human recognition as a governor, but the fact that he was called by the Lord 
was so important. It reminds me of 2 Peter, uh, the letter of Peter, where Peter is writing and he says to the people, you are God's elect. Yes, you're scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia because of all the persecution, but you're God's elect. You are chosen by him. You're strangers in the world, but chosen by God. I don't know about you, but you might be going through a very tough time yourself. And you wonder if you really do have any friends. Maybe it's persecution that you're facing from those around you. Well, the wonderful thing is that you are chosen by God. And though there may be great dignity attached to human positions, the greatest dignity comes from being called by God. He has invested us with his dignity. And these people needed to know that they were God's people. God had placed them there for a special purpose. He had called them. Do you remember on one occasion the disciples came back to Jesus and they were falling over each other, wanting to tell the Lord Jesus what had happened. He'd sent them out to heal and to preach and uh, take his message around. And they came back and said, isn't it wonderful? We've seen this happen and that happen. We've seen even the evil spirits subject to us in Christ's name. And Jesus said, just wait a minute, wait. Rejoice not so much in all those things that you've seen happening. Rejoice mostly that your names are written in heaven. Because that's where our dignity comes from, that we belong to him. Here today, you may belong to a church that has magnificent buildings, big crowds of people, and you think, isn't it all wonderful? Ah, oh, but that's not the, really, the real thing to rejoice over. The real thing to rejoice over is that your names are written in heaven. On the other hand, you might be a very small group of people, just a handful of people, the important thing is that you're called by God. So the ring speaks to us of that sense of dignity and purpose because God has called us. But a ring also speaks to us of security. You see, the ring was on the king's finger. It never came off the king's finger. And being a signet ring, the purpose of it was not just to look nice, but it had the crest of the monarch engraved in it, so that when he had a document to send to somebody, there would be wax or clay put at the bottom of the document and he would press into it his signet ring, which showed that when the recipient received that document, it had actually been seen by the king, because nobody else had the crest of the king on his finger, it had actually been seen by him. And he had actually read it and hand, hand, uh, handled it. It's a real sense of security. The king himself knows about it. In Isaiah, on one occasion, the Lord through Isaiah said, Can a mother forget the child that she's born? And you think to yourself, well, of course, a mother could not forget the child that she's born. But in those days, we would sometimes say life is cheap in some areas. Lots of people died in childbirth. Both parents, mothers and uh, children particularly died at childbirth. And perhaps families, they would have lots of children and several would have died in childbirth. And it's, I suppose it is possible for her to forget, forget that child sometimes. And sometimes they would engrave on her hands the names of her children, so that when she was kneading the bread or milking the goats or working in the fields, constantly the names of her children would be in front of her and she would sin, uh, remember that. And uh, Isaiah says to these people, Can a mother forget? Yet I will not forget you. I have you engraved on the palms of my hand. I will not forget you. I love that little verse that comes in Psalm 8. What is man that you are mind full of him. You ever thought that God's mind is full of you? He is mindful of you. Think of it, you're never out of his sight, you're never out of his mind, you're never out of his love, you're never out of his care. When you feel very low and you have done things that you're ashamed to think about now, he still loves you with the same intensity that he did when he sent his son to the cross for you. He loves you. 
God loves you with that same burning intensity. Isaac Watts once put it like this in his wonderful hymn, My name from the palm of his hands eternity will not erase. Impressed on his heart, it remains in marks of indelible grace. Yes, I to the end shall endure, as sure as the earnest is given, more happy, but not more secure than glorified spirits in heaven. To think that we're no more likely to fall out of God's favour than the very spirits in heaven because we're engraved on the palm of his hand. So the ring speaks of this sense of dignity and security. But of course it speaks also of beauty. Usually speaking, that's why rings are chosen. How difficult it is to choose a ring. And I was thinking the other day, there's, you could scan the whole of the universe. Look at the vast vistas of the universe and all those planets and galaxies that have been created. And if God were to do that, and then to look down to the microscopic and the things that we're only just beginning to discover, so small. Through all that God has created, there is nothing that is more precious in his sight than the sinner saved by grace. Do you remember the story of John Newton? He was the great slave trader who was converted in a mid-Atlantic storm on one day and he became a minister in the Church of England. And in his study, having been converted, his whole life changed. Over his desk he had a plaque with one verse of the Bible on it. Isaiah 43, verse 4. You are precious and honoured in his sight. Just think as he sat there. You, John Newton. You are precious and honoured in his sight. You who were a slave trader, who traded in human flesh, who could silence the rest of the sailors with the foulness of his language. You are precious and honoured in his sight. You are precious. Precious in his sight. You are precious and you are honoured in God's sight. You are precious and honoured in God's sight. I mean, it'd be one thing if he was precious and honoured in the sight of men, but to be honoured by God. How wonderful it is. How do you think John Newton felt about that when he sat at his desk? But you know, the Lord Jesus, in coming to this earth for us, shows that we are precious and honoured in his sight. He sent his Son for us. So the ring speaks of this dignity and security and beauty, but of course... Finally, it speaks of his authority. The king's ring spoke of authority. And when an a edict was received by somebody with the seal on it, stamped by the king's ring, it came with real authority. And the person who received it was expected to act upon it. Just reminds us, as, Paul, uh, as uh, Haggai spoke to these people, and Zerubbabel in particular, he said, look, I've made you like my signet ring. Zerubbabel, you have real authority. You go in my name. Go and do the work. I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. Ezekiel put it like this, I'm sending you to a rebellious nation. The people I'm sending you to are obstinate and stubborn, but you're to say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, they will know that a prophet has been among them. So when we go out with the good news of the gospel and we share with other people, we don't handle it in a take it or leave it attitude and say, well, it's just what we believe anyway. No, it comes with real authority, the authority of God. We're like the ring on the king's finger. So how encouraged these people must have been and how encouraged we should be because we are like a ring on his finger because we too have been chosen for his service. God bless you.